Good evening and um, thank you for the invitation. Um, before I will begin my talk, and I will talk a little bit about the almost future and the past and how it came to be, I would like to take one minute of our time tonight to talk about the present because um, for the past week um, I've been involved with a project uh, to help refugees and we have um, designed a website that has gained significant traction over the past two days with almost 10,000 hits. It's called refugeephrasebook.de and it's an open phrasebook to help refugees with uh, two to 300 different phrases in up to 35 different languages that everyone um, is invited to participate in. So if you feel like you have something to contribute and we're especially looking for people with a medical background or um, a background in law, um, you're very welcome to go on this website and help out. A print version will be available on the weekend. And this is something that everyone who has access to a printer in their office at the university somewhere else can print out and distribute um, where you think it is uh, of use, for example, in Dreiskirchen. Thank you. The title will make sense, uh, I hope, during the talk a little bit. And um, I chose to talk about technology mostly today because of the last exhibition that was here in Augarten before the current exhibition about rare earth materials, because this is something that Boris and I have also collaborated on. So you might all have heard about the terms post-internet or post-digital, you have heard about rare earth minerals. And what I would like to start with is to say that there is no such thing as the post-digital. Or rather, while the story surely, or at least hopefully, goes on, we should make clear to ourselves that under the technological condition of today, a prefix like post does not only make no sense, it inhibits feasible thinking and acting within the technological complex. During a legendary cab ride that may or may not have taken place, Niklas Luhmann once said to Friedrich Kittler, Friedrich, there is no such thing as the postmodern. There is only the modern postal system, the moderne post. You see, what we are dealing with are materials, infrastructures, waste, and also what I want to demonstrate here tonight, there is no such thing as the cloud. Let's start by looking at the infrastructures, those more or less stable and rigid structures underneath it all and invisible to most of us, since even silly media theorists wanted to make us believe at some point that with the advent of the internet, mobile phones or Wi-Fi, something had become immaterial. Nothing, neither communication, media, nor labor has become immaterial. On the contrary, material costs, rare earth mineral mining, workforce, waste, climatic effect, etc., are growing exponentially, while something very strange happens. Media technologies themselves become invisible and intangible. As our devices become more and more reduced to sheer, transparent, touchable interfaces, it is exactly this tangibility that makes them intangible. The seemingly intuitive approach to smart technology is doing the exact opposite. It prohibits access to the technology and inhibits knowledge and understanding. In the ability to use this technology, a toddler and a businessman do not differ. But the interfaces which supposedly give you access to the world at your fingertips mainly do one thing. They keep you away from the source code and the circuit boards. They make the mechanism intransparent while making you transparent to the companies and intelligence services. As our tools get lighter, the weight of our data increases. Contrary to what you may think, you do not own your technology. You void its warranty when you try to fix it yourself, and this does not only apply to laptops or phones. The Digital Millennium Copyright Act in the US, for example, forbids you to inspect and repair 
code and software that runs in your car, which is basically every new car these days. Furthermore, the internet is not for free. You pay with your data in a quasi-religious indulgence of cybernetic capitalist accumulation. This movement towards invisibility is a convergence with what we call a black box. The trick being played here, however, is that we don't even wonder what's in the box anymore because it's not the rabbit, it's the box itself that has disappeared. So slowly and surely technology becomes invisible. Soon it will be a contact lens, an implant, a nanobot, and this is a scenario of the very near future. And while you may act outraged, you won't even notice, and very soon you will want it. And at some point, your children will be born with what we might call hereditary technology. Besides all the drones which kill people, deliver your Amazon orders, make funny fail videos, or peek at naked girls next door, besides navigation with Google Maps, besides the Internet of Things, your smart home, your networked kitchen appliances, and thermostats, which constantly collect and trade data about your behavior in any conceivable way, what is happening already in the wake of these developments is the proceeding becoming autonomous of technology. Tiny machines the size of dust particles, or even on a nanoscale, used to measure environmental or health data inside your body and is designed to behave like an organism. Sekunde, wir müssen den Ton noch mal kurz umstellen. Because every street and every building will have a network of microcomputers built right into them. Dr. Chris Piester calls it smart dust. A smart dust particle or moat is a wireless sensor with sensing, computation, communication, and power in one package. These all-in-one microcomputers will be small, very small. The size of a moat today is about the size of a grain of rice. And we've shown that we can make the circuitry small enough and light enough that eventually it will be possible to make things that are on a sub-millimeter size scale. Tiny specks of computer smart dust will form a vast invisible network that can help manage the infrastructure of even the largest city. Smart cities in the future will take this low power, inexpensive, small technology and basically distribute it everywhere. These tiny computers record information about their surroundings, information they can send to other computers or to you. Smart dust on the tracks will monitor your commuter train so you know if it's running late. Potholes will be able to report themselves and warn your car. And you'll never have to wait for a radio traffic report again. They're monitoring the flow of traffic and giving you alerts about what route is the, the right way to go to keep the traffic moving. Bridges will get a coating of smart dust particles that can warn us when they detect stress fractures, helping avoid deadly collapses. But smart dust will also allow buildings and streets to recognize you and respond accordingly. I think increasingly, the environment will respond to who we are and adapt in consequence. The city will know where you are if you want it to. Your workplace will know you. Smart dust at the entrance will boot up your computer. And smart dust embedded in the elevator doors will automatically ring your floor. Smart dust is going to sense the environment and allow us to improve the way that we live our lives. No matter how we live in the future city, it will be radically different. The video is kind of funny, I know. So, these modes, they are programmed to be resilient, to defend themselves against damage or manipulation. And you can imagine what the implications would be if you remember, for example, when we heard about the plans that hackers were trying to kill 
Dick Cheney by hacking his Wi-Fi connected pacemaker. They are programmed to act like something alive, which will eventually make them come alive because they cease to merely exist and start being with a capital B. They are modeled from the behavior of animals or insects, swarms of all kinds, or even slime molds. And this is a very interesting video where um, slime mold behavior is used to model the way that um, communication networks or transport networks could work. This is um, a map of Spain and the slime mold is used to sort of find the most uh, optimized way to move from one point to another point by basically looking for food. Just like our environment has been influenced by chemical agents, pollution, crop seeds, etc., for centuries, technology is already becoming something that is not separated from nature anymore, but a part of it. Nanobots become nanobotanic, technology becomes techno-organism. Raindrops will have Wi-Fi, if you will. With this, we also have to reconsider on a fundamental level what consciousness and intelligence mean which of course is a very complex issue we won't be able to solve here today. Although, if you can, please raise your hand, which is a problem now because I can't see you. Anyone? Well, that's a good sign, because if anyone had raised their hand, it would have been an indicator um, that we already have artificial intelligence and that you're probably a replicant. Um, something else that I would like to show you is um, something you've probably seen in the past couple of weeks because basically it was everywhere. It was called Google Deep Dreaming, um, which is an image recognition software that works according to neural networking, which basically has nothing to do with the brain. It's just the way that connections are, are modeled, um, which also is a, a very interesting way of optimizing networks called um, optimal brain damage. I always really like that a lot. So if you want to do something really, really productive, it's very important that you're brain damaged. Um, I'm just going to let this run a little bit. This is, this is a live use of the Google Deep Dream um, software, and you can see the term that it's currently trying to hallucinate into another picture and it's very relaxing. Both the hardware and the software part of our reality emerge from something that has only recently entered the public mind, cryptology. Cryptology is not a symptom of information technology, but it's a condition of possibility. Encoding information, transmitting it through a channel with a certain aspect of noise, filtering or protecting it against this noise, and decoding it on the other side is what media technologies do long before Claude Edward Shannon formalized it in his 1948 book, A Mathematical Theory of Communication. Uh, this is also, these are some, some nanobots there um, trying to eat up cancer cells. So this is um, the model that every information technology is based on, um, which is from a book from 1948 by Claude Edward Shannon. Why it is easy to trace back, our, in, trace back into our recent past of telegraph and telephone networks, as well as Alan Turing's World War II efforts of breaking the German Enigma cipher machine, let me point out that cryptology is as old as information itself. As soon as you have a system with which you encode information and meaning, say the alphabet, you scramble. Um, but I won't bore you with its mathematical and media history now. Just going to show you some pictures. Can anyone read this? This is the so-called Caesar cipher. Can anyone um, figure out how it works? It's very easy. There's a hint also, exactly. It's called an alphabetic substitution cipher, which means you take one alphabet and you map it onto another alphabet, which is just one or more steps 
um, shift it to the left or to the right, and then you use this letter instead of the other one, which is also the reason why Stanley Kubrick's Hell 9000 was uh, tip of the hat to a company called IBM. This um, has a very long history, which comes actually from the history of book printing, because um, if you can imagine what happened for the... Can you imagine what happened the first time when people started printing books with movable type in Gutenberg's time? Imagine you're a book printer and you have a very practical problem once you start printing books. The problem that you inevitably have is that you will need more letters of, say, an E um, than of an X. So you end up with uh, statistical knowledge about how language works. And this, of course, is something that was very soon um, very interesting for people like this guy, Leon Battista Alberti, who um, some people might also know as the inventor of linear perspective, who wrote the first uh, book about cryptology, the Zifris, in 1466, where he invented this kind of substitution cipher and this little tool that you can see here, the so-called cipher disk, where you can choose your alphabet um, and the way you shift alphabets against each other. Infrastructures, information channels, have always been built by those in power. So it is tragic that even for a moment we thought that those in power do not control and monitor them, because infrastructures like the internet are made for that. Cryptology and the way that you can and should use it, and it may hide you, but it does not obscure. It makes the mechanism transparent and less cryptic. Two things, however, obscure this. Two metaphors that have become to govern how we think about the internet as a social, economic, political, and legal space. Cloud computing and the darknet. The funny thing is that each means the exact opposite of what the name says. The term cloud computing is most probably a result of the sloppiness of computer scientists when it comes to PowerPoint graphics. And as a former student of computer science, I can confirm that. Popular law has it that the term actually does originate in the visualization of clusters of computers on slides with the prefigured cloud design that you can see here that was available in PowerPoint presentations. In the recent years, marketing and political campaigns have modeled this into a metaphor of ubiquitousness, of something fluffy, ephemeral and celestial, light blue, almost transcendent. The cloud, however, is camouflage. It's a smoke bomb, a fog machine, a phantasmagoria that cloaks a massive campaign of data centralization and hegemony. It obscures how, right now, as the Internet is past its teenage years, new mechanisms of political, economic, and infrastructural control are solidifying, and the weight of our data increases. Just like in our faces, the wrinkles our data creates on the Internet now won't really go away anymore. This is why we need, if I may make this stupid analogy, a way of establishing a healthy and informed regime of living with the Internet, instead of just Botox. Decentralization, by for example keeping your data on external hard drive instead of Dropbox, is ultimately much less cryptic and more transparent than the cloud. The darknet, at the same time, is not dark at all. It is the actual open space of the internet. It is where you can determine yourself what you want to see, the real hashtag no filter. Just to clarify what the darknet is, the darknet basically means everything on the internet that is not indexed by search engines. So this is almost 96% that you can't find with Google or anything else. And uh, this is a commonly used image um, when it comes to describing the Internet as an entity and the way that the darknet weighs against the part you can actually see above the surface. This is quite interesting to note, however, that it's the same image that is also has been used to describe the Freudian model of the psyche. Um, so we might ask ourselves is, if consciousness or um, the superego is nothing but a search algorithm.
because this also means that any kind of shenanigans, legal and illegal, can be done on the darknet, the question of regulation and deregulation is, of course, a factor. If you want, I can show you around the darknet later if there's still some time during the discussion or after, and we can buy weapons and drugs. However, the internet is a realm of law, is approximately in the same state supranational, international waters was two centuries ago, and again, the same metaphors, pirates mostly are at play, for better or worse. Digital rights allow and demand a completely new consideration of how law and space relate to each other. It is due to a structural problem of technology commodification and understanding of law that lets open sources seep into black boxes that digital rights only entered the public consciousness after the revelations of WikiLeaks and Edward Snowden. Outrage that intelligence services who significantly co-developed our information systems architecture collect and use our data is evidence of a certain immaturity. In a time in which digital media permanently co-determine every aspect of our lives and will continue to do so to an even greater extent, such immaturity counts as one of the central problems of our society altogether. Digital rights not only means that the private sphere of informational self-determination, as well as the copyright of producers and businesses, artists and whoever, shall be protected. That is, it is not only the limits of law that should be respected, but first and foremost, its openness. Governments turn into businesses, and businesses into governments, which effectively implement legislatures, or at least try, in the case of SOPA, BIPA, and all these kinds of different laws that this guy you can see here try to fight. In contrast, these procedures cost activists either freedom of movement, or in the case of Aaron Schwartz, the author of the Guerrilla Open Access Manifesto and spearhead of the digital right movement and around Creative Commons, his 26-year-old life. Rihanna's statement to digital rights, on the other hand, is simply, bitch better have my money. How nations and supranational informational architecture are related to another is far from clear. Angela Merkel famously called the internet Neuland and got ridiculed for that. You might uh, also know that Neuland in Germany is a seal for organic meat. But this is, in a way, tragically what it is. And now that we know, thanks to Snowden, that all the conspiracy theories are true, that all our communications are being surveilled all the time in what we can call the tragedy of totality and totalitarianism, we arrive at a space beyond paranoia. Just because you're paranoid, it doesn't mean they're not after you. All your fears are true. And for the first time, people cared about, about it was when it was about the NSA being able to see your dick. TV commentator John Oliver famously interviewed Edward Snowden about this in Moscow, and I quote, this is the most visible line in the sand for people. Can they see my dick? So with that in mind, look inside that folder. This is a picture of my dick. So let's go through each NSA program and explain to me its capabilities in regards to that photograph of my penis. This is where we are. There is no reason to be paranoid anymore. It's all true. It's all happening. This leads us to understand that we can do something new in this new land, this Neuland. We can become post-paranoid. We can build Paranoiland. We are moving in a space that is still leagues away from guaranteeing any fundamental security and freedom across national borders. Security here, more than anywhere else, means freedom from regulation. The question is whether the internet will ever be the kind of space that the cyberpunks of the 1990s imagined. This media ecology requires a fundamentally different economic, political, and artistic practice in order to counteract the colonization of the internet 
which for a long time has not been taking place outside or beyond our world. And something that is just starting to come into play is full-blown cyber warfare. With the advent of so-called D-weapons, D as in digital and following the ABC as in atomic, biological and chemical of the 20th century, it becomes clear that there is no international convention like the Geneva Convention for this kind of warfare yet. This is especially problematic under cryptographic aspects since one central character trait of these weapons is concealing that they exist and concealing or faking their origin. Infrastructures attacking infrastructures, electricity grids, power plants, the internet, etc. A worm like Stuxnet that you might have heard about, which attacked a nuclear reactor in Iran a couple of years ago, was wreaking havoc undetected for a long time until someone first realized that it was even there. This is all just the beginning. And while the NSA surely is the big player here, it is also diverted atten attention from what we were all thinking about before. China and its army of hackers and the so-called Great Chinese Firewall. It is a little known fact that the original term information warfare was coined in a white paper by a young officer in the Signal Corps of the People Liberations Army named Shen Wei Guang in the year, of course, 1984. Which brings me to the next and last part of my talk tonight. Oh. Let's say China. 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 You go over to China. 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 You take China. 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 I love them. China. 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 I have to have my China. China. China because China. 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 China, 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 China now, China, China, you know, China. I know China very well. China, 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 Northwest Wisconsin, where I'm from. It's China to me, China. We're going to watch the whole thing. China, 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 China. You want to buy from China? That's great. Buy from China. Buy toys from China. China in particular. China, China. I have people that I know in China. China, China. China. China, 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 China. I've been saying China, 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 China. Let me ask you about China. China. I go to China. China, 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 China. People from China, they love me. China. China, 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 China. In China, they say I don't like China. I love China. People think I don't like China. I love China. China, China is the new China, by the way. China, China, China. I deal with China. China, China, big league China. So don't tell me about China. I know China. China, 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 China. Whether it's China, China. So if you went to China and you wanted to get a job in China, I don't knock China. How could I dislike China? The man from China, China. You have China, Carl. Take China. China, 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 China's over here. Look at what China's doing. They're learning from China. China, China, okay? Look at that. Isn't that nice? China, 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 China. And by the way, I love China. I mean, I love China. How can you not love China? I love China. China, China. China, 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 China. And you know China, 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 South China, China, China. People say, oh, you don't like China. I like China. China. I love China. China. China all the time. China. When was the last time you heard China?
The thing is, if you say something often enough, it becomes meaningless, or at least very strange. You can try it with your own name. Paul, 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 but I'm going to stop. Because the same is true with China. Instead of understanding China, it's just all Chinese to us. It so happens that China actually played a very significant role in the establishment of the technological reality that we live in now in the past, but starting not in the 19th, but in 1584, when the Jesuit missionaries arrived in China, and because of the lack of Chinese interest in Christianity, started a scientific exchange between East and West that informed the scientific developments of the blooming Baroque of the 17th century in lasting ways. Apart from cultural techniques and religion, it is understandably the Chinese spoken language, which is a musical language, a tonal language, and its writing system that is very separate in, uh, in comparison to our system from that language that most fascinated the alphabetic culture of the West, which has just started to develop the notion of mathematical codes and formulas. The 17th century can be seen as giving birth to, among many other things, the idea of computability. This is partly due to the sudden phenomenon of Baroque big data, if you will. With new mathematical tools like Newton's and Leibniz's calculus for astronomy and every other kind of natural phenomena, as well as the rapid exploration of large parts of the world, including China, and newly established faster and more effective information networks, the amount of knowledge to be dealt and with prompted many thinkers to try and develop universal languages, coded languages, if you will, rational languages that could already convey ideas rather than just meaning, as well as devices to make the tedious calculation by hand obsolete, computers. After all, scientific and technological invention and progress very often is a direct result of laziness. Chinese, some thought, might already be such a universal language and writing system. This led to a lot of speculation and to few direct results. What it did, however, was prompt someone like Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz to probe in a very analytic way what symbolic systems like mathematical formulas or alphabets could or could not do, what can be encoded, encrypted, and computed, and where the limits of this could be. Leibniz can also be read as the first media thinker. While his mathematical work builds the foundation for today's computing machinery, and his engineering work contributed greatly to the idea of mechanization processes of calculation and ultimately thought, he was building um, calculation machines, he was also perhaps the first thinker of the postal system of the network. For Leibniz, thinking meant sketching and distributing. Instead of just sitting in his chamber and writing heavy books, Leibniz sent out thousands of letters to his personal network spanning around the whole planet, with over 1,200 nodes reaching as far as Beijing. At the same time, the academy system begins to free academic knowledge from church and court. Being in a network becomes a defining dispositive of knowledge production. This is just to give you a feeling that the state that we're in right now with networked information is far from being something new. Leibniz's way of working on incorporating Chinese knowledge into his system makes him the first truly international thinker. He can, without exaggeration, be said to be substantially influenced by Chinese knowledge on almost all his levels of endeavor. He even published a journal called Novissima Zinica, the latest news from China. The Chinese whispers, the Stille Post, in our seemingly purely Western lineage of knowledge are much louder and clearer, clearer than we are usually aware of, because it is a very Western, Christian, and colonial politics of the history of knowledge and its branding that is at play. Even when Leibniz invented the binary notion for numbers with zeros and ones, which all our computers 
are based on, China played a big role. Leibniz didn't know what to do with it. Representing numbers with zero and one was merely a mental exercise for him, which didn't have any application yet. So Leibniz did what he did, um, and he sent out a couple of letters. A while later, which in this case, because the postal systems were quite slow, meant a couple of years, he received a response from a Jesuit in Beijing informing him that his zeros and ones just looked just like the construction of the triant hexagrams of the I Ching, the Book of Changes. And those trigrams, it is said that they were the original eight characters of the Chinese writing system as invented by the legendary Emperor Fuzi approximately 7,000 years ago. So Leibniz thinks, well, it seems I have rediscovered a very ancient truth that connects us with the Chinese writing system, with mathematics, with logics, and with the operations of the mind. And it's only this realization that prompts him to publish his so-called Explication de l'arithmétique binaire, for Prince Eugen in Vienna, by the way, even sketching out first ideas for binary calculating device or computer. His last and in a way most cryptic and important work, the so-called monodology, is predated by another book which he wrote on the so-called natural theology of the Chinese. In this book, he analyzed an ancient Chinese term of natural philosophy called Li, which he later simply replaced by the European term monad. In Leibniz's world, Descartes' mechanistic world is a thing of the past. Leibniz, in his living network, is the first thinker of ecologies and organisms, also writing systems seen as organisms. We witness the world changing from a necessary theodicee, justifying the existence of God and evil in the world, to that of what we might call a technodicee, the description of an all-encompassing machine made up of organic parts, or smart dust. The language it is written in is Chinese, the language of which no one knows how it works. Its characters are monads, the language, its environment, its grammar and ecology without, na without nature. Practicing this science means creating art. A few centuries later, in the early 1930s, when Alan Turing is starting to lay and create the cathedral, lay the foundations and create the Cathedral of Computability on Leibniz's foundation, Norbert Wiener, whom you might know as the father of cybernetics, moves to Beijing to teach engineering and mathematics at Tsinghua University and study Chinese language and philosophy. Before him, Bertrand Russell, Alfred North Whitehead, and Albert Einstein traveled to China and gave lectures. Russell's interpreter during his journeys, a young mathematician and linguist named Chao Yun-ren, would later also befriend Wiener and contribute greatly to the foundation of cybernetics during the Macy conferences in the early 1950s. He is also responsible for the first translation of Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, which became such a big hit in China that it spawned a China-exclusive sequel called Alice's Adventures in China, because what comes after Wonderland and is even weirder. He also wrote pop songs and coined the English term for steer fry for Asian cuisine. Norbert Wiener and his Chinese colleagues built electrical networks and analog computers while in China. But at the same time, with Wiener being exposed to the Chinese language, and philosophies of Neo-Confucianism and Taoism, philosophies of the organic and the process, it is safe to say that the very early ideas for cybernetics with its special approach to techno environments and organomachinic feedback processes, our reality today came into being in and through China. I went through large parts of Norbert Wiener's archive at the MIT a while ago, dreaming as you can imagine of hand-sketched circuits and networks mingling with Chinese writing practice, gradually merging and entangling, but I didn't find any. I will keep looking, and hopefully the next time I will be here, I can show you something. Thank you very much. <laughs>